When and where were you born? I was born in Athens, 1939, just before the World War arrived there. What sort of family was yours? Both my parents were uh, high school mathematics teachers. And they they moved to North Greece? Well, after, after the war, they got a permanent job. And they were moved, they were posted there in North Greece, to Gilgis. What was your childhood like there? Difficult, we didn't have material things. We did have toys. We we were were making our own toys. We we wouldn't have any (coughs) already made. Mm -hmm. We never had a ball. And I suppose you didn't have things like bicycles or no, 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 no. Bicycle, bicycle. It was what is what is a Cadillac for today? Mm -hmm. For us, then a bicycle was a luxury thing. You couldn't get any. When there, the, you, you couldn't afford a ball to play, a proper ball. And when was your sister born? Well, my, my sister born, was born nine years after me. We were still in Kilkis when she was born. And when did you move to Thessaloniki? A year, a year after she was born. And... There, I went the last two primary school classes and then went to the high school. So how how did you end up being a seaman? Because I liked traveling. I liked sailing. Did you know it very early that you wanted to be a seaman? No, not really. It was when I had to decide what I'm going to career to follow. Well, my parents wanted me to go to the university or to the polytechnic and to become a civil engineer. And I started preparing for that. But in the last year, I I decided I didn't want to go. And what did they (laughs) think about your choice? Well... My mother not much about it. <laughs> she didn't like it at all for me to be away. My father took it all right and not really objected. Just asking me why and that's all. What sort of training did you need for becoming an engineer? It had just started the state college for engineering that was near Athens. So I had to go there for three years. And it was three years course. And when was that? I went there when I, I finished the high school, 57, 1957. And what was this college like? It was like a military school and very strict. I would say sometimes stricter than a military school. And we were living in the school. We were in... Mm-hmm. It was in a dormitory. Yeah. yeah. And what sort of training was it? High standard engineering with even elements of political engineering, theoretical plus practical, doing things with your own hands and uh, learning to work with the uh, power machines. Did you do any practicing service in between the school years? No, the practice was after we finished the college. Then we had to go as apprentice engineers for one and a half year of service before getting our third engineer's license. You did your military service in the Greek Navy. What was it like those days? It was it was an easier service than in the army or in the or in the air force. How long was it? Two and a half years. 
And where did you do your service? In the beginning, near Athens, and then the rest in Salamis Navy Yard. Well, Salamis was also near Athens. It was also the junta time, wasn't it? So during my time in the Navy, yes, came junta. So what was your first sailing like, and when did you first join the ship? After I finished the college and got my license from the 1961, so before before Christmas, left Athens by train to went to Trieste, where I, in Italy, where I joined the ship. It was a bulk carrier. And where did it go? From uh, Trieste, our first my, my first port was New Orleans where we loaded corn and carried it back to Rotterdam. What sort of job did you do then? On board the ship, I was mm. supposed to be apprentice engineer. And what does that mean? Which means that I was, I should be assistant of the officer engineer. In the Greek ships, we do all the repairing and maintenance work. The only thing is that they treated us not as officers, but as wipers, actually, just to do all the manual job. Cleaning. Cleaning, yeah, the, the manual job that wasn't really our job to do. On what sort of ships did you used to work? On uh, cargo ships, freighters. And uh, what were you transporting? Whatever exists in the shops could be carried by the ship. Small machines, big machines, paper, uh, foodstuff, even fresh vegetables or deep frozen meat, depending, of course, on the cargo, of, of, on the type of ship that you were. But whatever exists in the shops, they are carried by the ships. So what were the working conditions in the 60s and 70s in Greek cargo ships? In, in one word, I would say awful. Then can you specify a bit? Well, the food wasn't enough and not good quality, for example. Working hours were long could be working 16 hours per day, and they try not to pay the extra. For extra time. For, for this overtime, yeah. Yeah. What about uh, the captain's position? The captain really had a lot of power in his hands. All this victualizing, I mean, getting the full staff on board and so on, it was passing through his hands completely. So there were quite a few of them that were trying to cheat both us and the company, getting second or third rate foodstuff and not giving enough what we should have according to the rules. You yourself, you were much, much thinner than every time you used to come home, you were very thin. And yes. I was a bit worried. Yes, because the quality of the food wasn't that good. Yeah. What was the accommodation like? Not, not, not very many amenities on board also, mm -hmm. especially for the crew. Did they have to share mm -hmm. the cabin with other people? Yes. And officers? Officers, uh, each officer had his own cabin. Yeah, and I suppose you didn't have many sort of uh, comforts there. It was plain and small yeah, cabin. Yes, yes. Only chief engineers and uh, captains were big. Big rooms? Not only rooms, they were small apartments, actually. Yeah. Uh, what about things like air condition or...? 
No, they, 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 they didn't exist on board the Greek ships. They weren't obliged to have them and they didn't have. Can you remember when you got your first one yourself? Eighties. What about the free time facilities? What were people doing at the free time? What could they do? Well, they were uh, reading. They were meeting in the smoking room. Playing vagabond there or cards. But uh, when sa- the ship was sailing, it wasn't that easy because the people kept watch. So mm. they had to be watched and then they had also to, to sleep. Started having more time in their hands and working like uh, in this daytime and the afternoon being free when the automation came in on board the ships. And that uh, would be 80s? Yes. Yeah, that must be a big change. Yes. Yeah. The yeah, automation, yes, and also cut uh, a lot of crew mm-hmm. from the ships. First of all, the, the, in, the, in the deck, they, the, they cut off the carpenter's position, which was a, a non-commissioned officer, let's say. And uh, they had less crew, less seamen on board. Was it also in the engine room? And in the engine room even more. The cats were, because they were uh, automation, no watch keeping. So they had, even they cut officers from there. Mm-hmm. How was it during your active career Were you always sure you would have work in the same company and was it generally easy to find work? To find work it was easy enough because Greece had the third biggest fleet. There were really a lot of ships and not enough seamen. What about this uh, working in the same company? In the same company, there you were never sure about it. The company, they could kick you any time, or you could go any time also yourself. I mean, if you didn't like it, mm-hmm. you, you could leave the company and go to another one. How did the working conditions change towards the end of the 90s? And to the better. They started the companies, the shipping companies, they started respecting more the rights of the seamen, and those rights also they were improved, slowly, slowly. The authorities also, they were supporting sometimes the seamen. And what are the authorities in this sense? The harbour authorities, the Greek harbour authorities, Mm -hmm. and the Ministry of Merchant Marine has its own separate ministry. The Merchant Marine of Greece, which controls, you're supposed to control the, the companies. Started automation coming on board the ship. Communications started being better and faster. And because of the communications, they started being safer, the ships and the, the navigation. A lot safer than used to be. Must be a really gross human error to have an accident. If they are a little careful, it was very safe. What did automation mean in a freighter? Mainly the automation it was affected the engine rooms. So made it safer because in case of something goes wrong, The alarm were coming, warning you that there is something wrong somewhere there. So you were going and you were correcting and rectifying it before it becomes a big problem. And what was the navigation 
like in the end of the 90s when you left the ship? They had navigators, like you have now in the, for the car. They, had, they started having those sort of navigators, so they knew any given moment where exactly the ship was, which was a, a very big improvement for safety. Did the engines change during your career? Yes, radically. Became a lot more efficient. They became bigger with really a lot of horsepower. Does it mean also that the ships be became bigger? Bigger and, and faster. But uh, mostly it was the efficiency of the engine. That because that affects the economy of the of the ship. How much consumption there is. What about the health on board? If somebody became ill, what were the ways of uh, helping? Well, duty is of a doctor had the chief the chief officer. They were trained some in the Red Cross. Greece before getting the license. So if it was some easy thing, he would administer straight away. If it was more complicated, then he will ask advice from the with the radio from the harbor authorities. So they will get a doctor near there there and will give instructions. And if it was a severe case or after an accident or what, if we were near land, will come a helicopter to lift the passing or the victim away. But if you were in the middle of the ocean, you had to cross your fingers and and wait. We, we wish for the best. When we were in the port, there wasn't any problem. Anyone could ask them to, to go to the doctor. The medical care, it was free. I mean, it, it was part of the company's duties. was the most uh, dangerous thing at your work? In my opinion, fire. The worst thing that could happen hmm. on board the ship. Did it ever happen? Once started, but didn't have time to progress. Anything else that was dangerous? There is, of course, there is a... If uh, the cargo is not well fastened or put in, calculated in the, in the, in the holes, and you encounter very heavy weather, that's a very dangerous thing as well. That could capsize the ship. Uh, what was the uh, most dangerous uh, sea condition that you encountered during your career? I think the worst one was end of 79. We left Canada a day before Christmas, actually, to go back to China. From the moment we went in, the ocean, we encounter storms, heavy storms, 10 buffer powers, and didn't stop all the way to Japan. Once we saw the sun, so we could find our position. All the rest who were going 
with the draconian, which means calculated where we should be. And we weren't sure for that, even because twice we had to turn the ship back against the storm to keep it in place, so to avoid being hit really bad and or capsized. And even managed to break one of the two lifeboats, which they are high up. Mm-hmm. Still came the the wave in and broke it. Night time. At that time, we didn't have any satellites or satellite navigation, so we didn't know where we were. We knew where we were when we reached Japan, and we saw the Japanese mountains. And at the same time, two ships went down around us. Were the pirates any problem uh, in your time? In the beginning of my career, there weren't any pirates around. But slowly, slowly, especially I think it was after the Vietnam War started coming up more and more. And where where would they be then? They started being around Singapore, the China Sea, Manila, I mean Philippines, in uh, Santos, Brazil, in Rio. Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And lately, Red Sea and Somali coast, and they are the worst. Did you actually meet uh, pirates yourself? Yeah, once we were attacked, beginning of the 90s. We had left Bangkok going to Hong Kong. And night time, they are in the China Sea. The officer on duty in the bridge saw uh, a small ship approaching. And then that ship used the searchlight to see the name of the ship, our ship. And after, after that, just took down a speedboat. But by that time, the ship was alerted, our ship was alerted. And I went downstairs to the engine room and put the engine in, in full full power. So we started going really full power and full speed. The speedboat was, of course, faster than us. But as we was approaching our ship and was near enough, we were turning the ship to the opposite direction. So with all this movement, the ship left behind a very big wave, which the speedboat could not stand, so we had to cut down. So chasing us again, when approaching, we were doing the same from the other side. So finally, they started shooting at us. From the speedboat? Yeah, but... Then they, they they stopped it left because we had gone already too far from the main boat or the mother boat. So you managed to escape? Yes. Well. Did they do any damage? Well, you, you could see the signs of the iron plates, but they couldn't penetrate the iron plates of the ship. So the question was to no- notice them early enough? And- yes. So, can you tell us where you have sailed or where you haven't sailed? 
more or less all over the world, except Australia, New Zealand, and oddly enough, Norway. Mm-hmm. Everywhere else where there is a sea, I have been. And all around America, North and South, Africa, and Asia. Did you ever sail to Finland? Yeah, only once. 1970 to to Oulu and finished loading in Kokola. What what were you loading from Oulu? Fertilizer for China. That, that was a long trip. How long did it take? Somewhere around 50 days. Because we were going around Africa. The Suez Canal. Yeah, the Suez Canal was... Uh, closed. Closed by from the worst. You have seen many interesting places during your sailings. Uh, can you name any to be the best? No, really, no. I cannot say which is the best. Everyone has its own. It is unique. There are so many interesting places. How has the world changed during your career from the point of view of a seafarer? Became more affluent. Could see Japan. In the beginning when I was going there, 60s, they were quite poor actually. But in... uh, very few years, they start really becoming a power. They started becoming more affluent, and more affluent, and more affluent. In China, you know, it took them a longer time to change to the better. But they, they, they changed a lot also. Nowadays, they, you could make any difference between them and a Western country. What was it like there in China when you first went there? It was a very poor country, generally. I mean, uh, the, the people were very poor. And they were economizing from everywhere. They wouldn't even have the heating on winter time in North China. They had taken us to the theater to see a performance. And we had to have all uh, overcoats hats and gloves on. Not only us, but the Chinese that were in also. Were there places that you couldn't see any progress during your sailing? Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, and African countries. What were your final working years in the end of 90s like? Very, very difficult. In what sense? Mental and physical. Because the company I was working with was expanding. And they got some old ships from uh, a Danish company, mass line from Japanese company also. So they were very difficult ships, they were big. Especially those Danish ships were steam ships actually in the beginning. I mean, they were built with turbine engines. And then for economy reasons, they had changed to diesel engines. And they were very big these are engines that they put in. But they had really all sorts of problems. I mean, problems that I didn't have encountered in my whole career. We had really to work manually, continuously, to keep the ship going and to keep the ship being in time in the ports. You had these tight schedules. Eh? Yes. And though they, the company started getting new ships, they wouldn't send me there because I was 
of the few that they could keep those ships sailing hmm. and in time. And often I had even to help through the telephone other engineers of the sister ships. And those responsibilities that were started piling up and up. Finally, I couldn't study it anymore. I mean, I was becoming old also. I started finding myself that I could really make decisions fast as I used to. And that started being dangerous also because it could cost lives. January 1998, you decided to retire. Why was that? I had started having problems physical problems, being very tired. I started feeling that I couldn't carry on mentally too. And the last road was that I had another thrum in my eye. And then I, I, I thought that I had lost the eyesight from that one. Before that, I mean, years back, I was half jokingly, I was saying that I would retire only when I would not be able to go up the cranes. Speaking about vertical steps going up. Well, I realized that I couldn't anymore carry on. So I decided that that was that. I had to stop. Do you ever miss the sea? In the beginning, a lot. But then again, whenever I started thinking about the sea, the sea life, then it was coming back again also to me the last years. And that was cutting off all the dreaming about the sea. But still I miss, sometimes I still miss the sea and the various feelings I could have there. Feeling the power of the sea, being alone, in the middle of nowhere, not seeing anything around you. Yeah, those, those are mostly what I, I, I miss. Not so much Port Harbor. Because the first years, okay, the harbors were all right. We, we had time. We were staying there. And you could go places. And we could go, I could go, in, and I didn't have the obligations as well, I mean, the responsibilities, so much. But then I couldn't have any more time for the ports. Even there were cases that I, in San Salvador, Central America, I managed finally to go out evening along with a few of other crew. And we went to the restaurant, sat down, we ordered. And the moment that they brought me there, the meat that I had ordered, there comes the deck officer on duty to call me back on board the ship because they had a problem with one crane. So I left it there as it wasn't back to the ship. You couldn't even relax anymore. What is the best thing you remember from your career? Or best incident? Best. One of the nicest things that I remember was watching a pair of seagulls using the ship as a hunting dog. We were approaching Panama from the Pacific side. Some sign, very calm sea. So as the ship was moving, the flying fishes were surprised and they were flying up out of the water. So the one seagull was flying over in front of it. And when they were coming up, was diving and catching them on there. So was catching it and was coming back to the ship and sitting on board the ship to eat it. And the second one was going up and doing the same thing. And so they, they, they were changing between themselves. Handing the, using the, the ship. Moments 
that I was going there in front, in the forecastle, in the semi-darkness, and feeling the, the power of the ship moving across the sea. You will think nothing can stop it, though the sea, the sea could stop it easily enough if it had a mind. That's of the best thing, I mean, that, that feeling that I had with the ship. If you were to give advice to a young man who dreams of sailing as a career, what would you say? To stay home. The sea and the seaman's life, it's not the romantic life that they think that it is. The adventure and seeing places. The sea life is completely different. And if you don't like it, it is a tor torture to be on board. Um, to finish with, uh, what would be your motto for having had a seaman's career? What was it? What did it mean to you? To me, and that's a personal, completely personal, it meant freedom. Because for most of the seamen, or the Greek seamen at least, they compare the ship with a prison. But for me it's freedom, because it's up to me what I'm doing. I decide what I do and how I do it. I just report to the company, but the choices are mine.